2 Peter chapter 1 is tonight's scripture reading. 2 Peter 1, we read the whole chapter. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavour that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation of the penman for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord's Day 11 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 11 begins a new section entitled Of God the Son. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, that is, a Saviour? Because he saveth us and delivereth us from our sins. And likewise, because we ought not to seek, neither can find, salvation in any other. 
Do such then believe in Jesus, the only Saviour, who seek their salvation and welfare of saints, of themselves, or anywhere else? They do not. For though they boast of him in words, yet in deeds they deny Jesus, the only Deliverer and Saviour. For one of these two things must be true. Either that Jesus is not a complete Saviour, or that they who by a true faith receive this Saviour must find all things in him necessary to their salvation. Beloved, in the last two Lord's Days of the Heidelberg Catechism, we have considered the triune God, especially God the Father, and creation... And then God triune, especially as Father in providence. And now we are turning from the triune God in creation and providence, especially the Father, to the incarnate Son of God and our redemption. First of all, we're going to deal with his names. Lord's Days 11. 12 and 13, these three Lord's Days, cover especially four names of Jesus. Jesus as Saviour, then Christ, Son of God, and Lord. And this evening we're considering this question, why is the Son of God called Jesus, that is, Saviour? Now, there are certain foundational truths about Jesus, our Savior, that we all want to get clear at start. The name Jesus itself means Jehovah salvation. And if you think of the first two words, two letters in English, the J-E, that's like the start of Jehovah. And then the next three letters, S-U-S, well, that's sort of like the Greek word for salvation. It's not so much like the English, though. But if you think of S, as in S-U-S, salvation, at least that much carries through. So Jesus, if you analyze the letters, think about that word itself, it will point you to the meaning, the two components that make up his name, Jehovah salvation. That's what the name of Jesus means. And that teaches us that this one who was born of the Virgin Mary and who was engaged in the ministry and suffering that we read of in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus is the embodiment and action of the triune God achieving, working out and perfecting our salvation. That's what he is, the embodiment of the saving action of God. By that I don't mean he wasn't a true and complete man. He was that. But he is embodying and acting God's salvation for us. And so when we deal in Lord's Day 11 and onwards with God the Son, we have not left behind the truth of the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But this true living God, he's the creator He's the providential governor, last two Lord's Days, and now he is also the Savior, and here's how he saves us, through Jesus, Jehovah Salvation, his special messenger and son. There is especially one verse in the Bible that sums up Lord's Day 11. It's Matthew 1, verse 21, the words of the angel to Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Jehovah's salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. Call him Jesus, Jehovah's salvation, because that's what he is all about, saving his people from their sins. And that's why the four Gospels aren't a biography of Jesus, aren't the life history of this one who was born in Bethlehem and brought up in Nazareth, 
The Gospels contain what they do and they omit other things because Jesus is the embodiment and action of God in saving us. And this gives us then the key propositions regarding salvation. This word of the angel in Matthew 1 verse 21. Salvation from. If you're delivered or saved from you know, some, some disease or some rabid dog that's running after you. You know what that means. I was saved from something. Will Jesus call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins? Jesus is God acting to save us from the evil rebellion that is naturally in human beings because of the fall and the curse against the infinitely good God. This sin will destroy and frustrate us because God's wrath and curse is operating through it. And Jesus comes and saves us from sin, saving us from its punishment, so that we, unlike the devil at the end of Revelation 20, or the beast and the false prophet at the end of Revelation 19, we won't be cast into the lake of fire, because Jesus has saved us from sin, its punishment. Jesus has saved us from the power of sin when he broke its dominion over us at the new birth and he progressively enables us to sing God's praises. And this, of course, by the way, is the test of our salvation. Are we who profess living in bondage? Are we going backwards into darkness and the captivity of transgressions or do we have new spirits that can praise the Lord because Jesus is the saviour he doesn't just save us from the punishment of sin so that we basically live godless wicked thankless lives like the unbelievers all around us he saves us from the power of sin and even when we do yield to it we repent of it and we turn from it and ultimately Jesus will save us from even the presence of sin so that it will not touch us at all. I'm referring, of course, to heaven, liberated from its touch completely. Salvation from, I was saved, says the Christian, from sin in all these different ways, saved from sin. And the Christian says, too, that it's not just the bad stuff that I've been delivered from, but Jesus saved me to something. And one could even say that this is a greater test of our profession. Jesus brings me to God. He brings me into fellowship with my Creator and Lord. He takes me from the guilt and misery of sin. And he gives me the glorious liberty of the children of God. So I'm not only free from, but I'm free to. I'm free to do things which I used to think were completely absurd, unnatural, terrible, like, like confess sins, like fellowship with God's people, like pray and mean it. And if we ask, how is it that Jesus saves us from sin and brings us back to the Father... We need another proposition, preposition, not now from and to, but in. In. We're saved from sin and we are saved to glorify God, our Creator and Redeemer, because we are saved in Christ, united to Him. In the Lord Jesus, that's how we're saved from sin and now we know God. And that knowledge of God is eternal life. And this is what the Catechism says. It says that Jesus saves and delivers us from our sins. Answer 29. And it says that we find in him, answer 30, 
all things necessary to our salvation. Lord's Day 11 is insistent too that Jesus is a complete saviour and that we do not save ourselves and the saints don't save us even in the slightest degree either. And you understand, of course, given the 16th century provenance of our confession, it's especially opposing Roman Catholicism because it's forever misdirecting faith and telling us to believe in all the wrong things. And the Catechism says, no, Jesus is a complete saviour. And here we think of the economy of salvation, God's deliverance of us from sin in Jesus Christ. And there are some parts of this great plan of God in saving us that are especially obvious that Jesus, the action and embodiment of God's saving work, is a complete saviour. If we think, for instance, of God's eternal decree of election, very obvious to see that that's entirely the determination of Almighty God. He chooses sovereignly and according to his own good pleasure who will be saved in Jesus Christ to the praise of his glorious mercy and who will be passed by and ordained to destruction to the praise of his glorious justice. And taking now the positive part, our salvation, that doesn't have anything to do with us. We weren't there we obviously had no vote. God is very clearly the complete and only saviour in Jesus. Then when we come to the cross, which took place some 2,000 years ago, there was Jesus all alone on the cross dying for our sins and no one had ever heard tell of us. And the disciples had fled away and Jesus was there alone, hanging between heaven and earth, rejected as it were, by even God at least that's how it looked to many and rejected by his followers and you say well Jesus died for all my sins I had no no hand nothing in that and then we come to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost again I say it's easy to see that salvation is of the Lord there because I, I wasn't there in Jerusalem and again, that was a sovereign act of Christ at God's right hand, pouring out the Spirit, even upon those who were there. But we wonder if we are all as clear that Jesus is a complete Savior in all of our lives and through time. I've spoken about God's <coughs> eternal decree and about the cross of Calvary and about the day of Pentecost. But, but what about during my lifetime? Maybe there's room for me partially to save myself here. After all, I exist and I am active in faith and I do perform good works. And the truth is, and this is what the catechism is stressing here as well, that Jesus is our complete saviour in all the aspects of our salvation, including, and perhaps now especially, in this life. And the truth is that he saves me in such a way that I become active without in any way jeopardising the truth that he is a complete saviour and that salvation is entirely of the Lord. Salvation then, and now we're setting aside for the moment God's eternal decree of election of us, his particular atonement, that of Jesus on the cross dying for our sins. We're setting aside that for the moment, though never neglecting that. That's, that's key, that's crucial. And all of the following flows from that. But we're focusing now on the broad term salvation with regard to its application to us in our lives. 
And this saving act of Jesus by his spirit in our lives includes acts in which man, you and I, are completely passive. The triune God in Jesus Christ regenerated us. And that was, as Jesus puts it in John 3 verse 8, the wind blowing wherever it wanted. The sovereign spirit regenerating this one, but not another one, regenerating this one as and when he pleases. Didn't even require a vote from us. God did it apart from our wills. Jesus saves us in effectually calling us. He calls each and every one of his sheep by name. That's an act of Jesus, the complete and only Savior. And in justification, God declares that we are righteous solely on the basis of the satisfaction for sin made by our Lord Christ and upon his perfect keeping of the law. God in Jesus declares, you are righteous. That's very obviously only an act of God. And when we are adopted, that rests upon the adopting father who adopts us in Jesus Christ. And to come to the last stage in the application to us of the salvation which Jesus purchased for us, coming to glorification, who else could do that? Who else could make us sinless, raise our bodies from the grave? And we didn't contribute anything to that, very obviously, either. So all of those things, those acts of God in Jesus in which we are passive, they too are very obviously, very obviously, works of Christ alone there are other things in our salvation though this doesn't disagree with anything i said before in which we do become active faith we believe without pride or vanity it's a simple statement of fact the believer believes obviously it's a tautology the believer believes doesn't he yeah but it's God in Christ who gives us the faith and works in us so that we believe. Jesus is a complete saviour there too. We repent. God doesn't confess sin. He isn't a sinner. He cannot sin. Jesus Christ doesn't confess our sins either for us. We repent. We turn to God but we turn to God because he turns us and causes us to turn so that God's people are made willing in the day of his power. That's Psalm 110. That's the proof in that Psalm that Jesus Christ is the king seated at God's right hand. He shows his power in making people turn to him in the day of his power in our lives. In sanctification, we are active. But it is God who sanctifies us. He makes us holy by infusing his Holy Spirit into us so that we, by his grace, consecrate ourselves to him. Willingly, gladly, consciously, we say, I belong to God, I reject the world and all its evil works, and I cleave to Jesus Christ, my only Savior. That's the attitude of a Christian. And the Christian is active too in persevering, that is, pressing on in the service of Jesus Christ. Despite all opposition, we persevere press on but it is God who preserves and keeps us 
so that we persevere. This brings us to 2 Peter chapter 1. In connection with Lord's Day 11, we're going to be considering especially the first 11 verses. Notice with me that Jesus Christ is called Savior, which explains his name Jesus, at the very beginning and at the very end of this section. Verse 1 includes this part. The righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And verse 11 refers to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the word Savior, mentioned at the very start and the very end of this section, is not thrown in as a mere epithet without any rhyme or reason. Jesus is called Savior here at the beginning and the end of this section because right through verses 1 through 11, it's presenting his work of salvation. That's what these verses deal with. And these verses speak especially of Jesus' work of salvation during our lifetime and in our experience just the things we're dealing with in this sermon it deals we could say with our salvation during our lifetime and in our experience from its initiation or start through its continuance and even right up to its perfection And the verses speak much and even forcefully of our activity. Verse 5 says, besides this, giving all diligence. Verse 10, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Christians are called to be diligent. Salvation is all the Lord, but our calling is to be diligent. In working out our salvation which God works in us. Remember this section dealing with the initiation, continuance, perfection of our salvation in our lifetime, in our experience is framed with references to Jesus Christ as our saviour. Verse 1 and verse 11. Three more things which we should note about this, this passage that speaks about Jesus as our Savior. It refers to the past and our conversion. It deals with the present and our sanctification. And then the future, with this it ends, when we enter the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as verse 11 puts it. Secondly, and we'll say more about this after a bit, the unifying factor, feature of Christ's saving us in the past and present and future in our lifetimes is, as we will see shortly, faith. Faith, all the way from beginning to end. And the faith, thirdly, dealt with in this passage is very obviously spoken of as a conscious trust and confidence in Jesus Christ. Let's look together at Jesus the Savior with three simple points following the structure of the opening 11 verses of this this chapter. Jesus the Savior, he has saved us, verses 1 through 4 referring to the past. He is saving us, verses 5 through 10, and he will save us in the future and perfectly and that more briefly in terms of space given to us in this sermon verse 11 Jesus the Savior the one who has saved us is saving us and will save us and just before I dive into that if you say Jesus has saved you the proof then is is he saving you now from your sins and on to fellowship with him. Because if he's not, then, then you're not, you never really received in the first place. 
And if he has saved you and is saving you, well then he most certainly will save you perfectly. Because Jesus is a complete saviour. Jesus then has saved us. I want to see first that in the opening verses of this chapter and indeed this book, we have references to glorious gifts that God makes to us in our past. Verse 1 says that we have obtained like precious faith. Past. We have obtained it. Verse 3 says, God hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And verse 4 continues that thought, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. All these gifts that we have already received when God first delivered us from sin unto Jesus. These three gifts then are all united in the idea of faith. Verse 1 again. It is addressed, this book, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. Verse 3. God, according to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And this refers to the power and the seed of faith in us, the Holy Spirit, within the Christian, through regeneration, and in this gift of the Spirit and union with Christ, we have already all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It is all there in seed form in the heart of the Christian. And then when verse 4 says that these things have been given unto us, these exceeding great and precious promises, what do you do with a promise? You believe a promise. That's the only thing a promise is, is good for. Faith. You believe it. You believe a promise. And this faith is presented more from its subjective, conscious, and experiential perspective. The believer, when he looks at verse 1, this epistle is written to those who have obtained like precious faith, says, well, that includes me. I have this like precious faith, and I too believe that it is extremely precious. And I'm thankful for this wonderful gift. This third verse, the one that talks about the inward power of faith, because in that seed of faith, we have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So we can't say, well... God didn't give me the tools to be holy. He left me sort of on my own. I had to put a shift in when I wasn't properly equipped. No, no. The new life. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. And verse 4, with these exceeding great and precious promises, what do you do with the promise? You, you behold it. You receive it as true. And you find your heart trusting in it. Leaning upon the promises of God and deriving strength from them. And the Christian says, just as he says this faith is precious, he says these promises, they're precious promises, they're great promises. Wow, look at all the things that I'm promised. These are exceeding great and precious promises. And my problem isn't that God just, you know, he, he, sent, me out, he sent me out to dig a field and he didn't even give me a spade, the only hand trowel or something. No, God has given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness and these promises our problem is that, and this is our sin too, that we're not yielding and filling our hearts and minds with the promises and acting upon them by his grace. So then according to these verses, how is Jesus our saviour? How is he saving us from and saving us to and saving us in himself? He gives us faith. 
And faith is the result of regeneration or the new birth and the effectual call of which I spoke earlier. God gives us new life in regenerating us. Then this new life shows itself in believing in God through Jesus Christ and not the lies of this present evil age. And when God calls us, he calls us by our name, powerfully and effectually, and he calls us from death to life, from unbelief to faith. And then through this faith, which God gives us in regeneration and calling, we receive the blessings of justification and adoption. And we know it. Being justified by faith or declared righteous through believing in Jesus, according to the promise, God declares and seals in our consciousness that we are righteous before God and therefore we have peace with him through believing, not working. And through faith, we are adopted because we are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 verse 26. Faith then is central at the beginning of our salvation. Now verse 1 is stated differently, states things differently than any other verse in the scripture because it says that we have obtained precious faith through the righteousness of God, our Savior Jesus Christ. Normally, the Bible speaks like this. There's the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, and we believe this righteousness, and we receive it. That is, we're justified. So through faith, we receive the righteousness of God. This verse, and it's unique in the Bible, turns it around and says that we receive faith through the righteousness of God. The idea is that Jesus Christ obtains the righteousness of God for us by his perfect obedience to God's law and therefore he merits and earns for us not only justification but the faith by which we then receive the justification. You could put it like this. Jesus earns the righteousness of God for us, perfect obedience to the law which will be imputed to us. But then through that righteousness which he obtains for us, God gives us faith. And then through faith, and this is what Paul teaches, especially in his epistles, we receive the righteousness of God imputed to us. Peter believes the same message as Paul, the gospel of justification, but he also adds something. It's not only through faith we receive the righteousness of God, but also through the righteousness of God, we receive faith. 2 Peter 1 verse 1. This faith, according to verse 1, we are said to have obtained. We obtain faith. And the word rendered obtain means to obtain by lot. That is, by divine appointment. So the lot of faith comes to us, not by chance, but by from the hand of God. One could paraphrase that famous verse regarding lots. Proverbs 16 verse 33. The lot of faith is cast into the lap. But the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. We obtain like a lot. God sovereignly allots faith to some people. So that it is a gift of the absolutely sovereign God. Jesus obtains, Jesus dies on the cross for his elect, obtains perfect righteousness for us, the righteousness of God, and then to those whom he has chosen, he allots, sovereignly gives faith, which faith then is the means of receiving the righteousness of God in justification imputed to our account so that we know we have legal standing before the Almighty already in our consciences and will have on the last day. And we obtain this faith, of course, from Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. He saves us in all of these ways too. 
And this, of course, in the very first verse of Second Peter, condemns the heresy of free will. The truth is that we obtain faith by a sovereign gift of God allotted to us, not by our running or meriting or even in part by our supposed free will. Which means, of course, that free will is an attack upon and a denial of Jesus Christ as Savior because he saves us by obtaining righteousness for us and thereby giving us faith which then receives the righteousness of God in justification. Faith comes in and destroys the gospel. Free will does. And one thinks of question and answer 30 of our Heidelberg Catechism. Do then such believe in Jesus, the only, the only Savior who seek their salvation and welfare of themselves or anywhere else, well, if they really believe that they're saved because of something they've done, their own faith, that's what they believe. They used free will, right? That's, that was the little bit that connected the, the electric, put into place so that the electric current could fly through the, flow through the circuit. That's not trusting in Jesus, the only Savior at all. That's Lord's Day 11. We should know, too, that as Savior... Jesus Christ gives each and every one of his true children the same faith. I'm not saying that everyone has the same amount of faith, for want of a better word, or the same measure of faith as the scripture actually does use those terms. But qualitatively, we all have, all true believers have the same faith. Jews and Gentiles, Old Testament and New Testament believers, the same spirit of faith, says Second Corinthians 4, verse 13, rich and poor, all classes, groups, and kinds of people. The Apostle Peter, who wrote this, had, and even has, the same power of faith in his heart, though faith isn't quite needed in the same way as heaven as it is now, as you and I and everybody else. John Calvin, Augustine, Elijah, Noah. We all obtain by a sovereign divine allotment like precious faith or literally the same kind of faith. And this means that at bottom and in the Christian church, all human distinctions are, as far as salvation goes, irrelevant. There are offices. They last for a certain time in the church. There are rules and functions within marriage. There are distinctions regarding age and the respect that ought to be shown to our elders and betters. But in the key essential thing, our salvation, men, women, children have Precisely the same faith. So at the church, in the church, the deepest, most important, and most enduring bond is the faith that we share, and that faith that exists in true believers, and this is what sin in us always tries to stop, is a greater bond and uniting the members than in all other societies. And that's why the church is the communion of the saints. The church is not like a, a university lecture hall where you can come and do your course and say hello to the guy or the girl next to you and go home and get your degree. But the church, everybody has the same faith. We're part of the one body. There's more to it than just passing yourself. And you don't put yourself at the perimeter on the edges. You don't have to live in everybody else's pocket or anything like that too. But there's a real spiritual bond, a commonality that unites everybody because everybody has in their hearts the same like precious faith. Except those who perhaps, well, anyone who falls away or is a hypocrite in the church. And that's why the community of the faith, that is the Christian church, is and ought to be for every Christian 
more important than any other interest. Your sport interest, if you have any, maybe you don't, can't be bothered with it at all, and that's perfectly fine too, or politics or anything else. Like precious faith, the community of the people of God. And this too is what is meant when it says that we all have obtained like precious faith or the same kind of precious faith because we all know God. And this is for us our eternal salvation as the bond which unites us to the Father through the Son and by the Holy Spirit. And 2 Peter starts making this point because 2 Peter is dealing with false teaching and heretics. And this point is, you have this like precious faith. Don't allow worldly influences or your own deceitful heart or these corrupt teachers to rob you of your faith or your joy and to make you lose out of the riches of your salvation in Jesus Christ. And so we could say, in the light of this word about Jesus the Savior and like precious faith, that this is the task of the Christian church in her preaching to exalt faith in Jesus Christ as the only way of knowing God. To promote faith as that saving bond we have with God in Jesus. And this is what creates church unity because there's this one like precious faith alone which binds us with Christ and therefore with one another. We say moreover that it is the clear, sharp, distinctive, reformed faith that is taught in the scriptures and summed in the reformed confessions which truly expresses Christ alone and faith alone. The power of faith in your heart and that whenever you come into contact with the pure reformed faith, the Holy Spirit, I won't say what the flesh does, but the Holy Spirit in you recognizes it as God's truth. You say amen to it, which is also to the serious problem when someone comes to church and their sins are approved or some truth is taught which makes life difficult for them and they say no. I don't want that. I don't want that. And they keep doing that and they harden their hearts and they end up in all sorts of trouble. And that's why Psalm 95 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus, the true Savior, saves us by giving us faith which responds to and focuses on and grasps the true objective faith. And Peter tells us that this faith in Jesus, this faith is our life. Verse 3. His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And this frees the church from any idea that it needs worldly wisdom or asceticism, or gimmicks. Just faith. All things that pertain unto life and godliness are there in the word which builds up faith in our hearts. Just faith, a mighty divine power within us, already been given us in our regeneration, so that nothing more is needed because this faith keeps taking us to Jesus Christ, the fountains of living water who has everything that we need for life and godliness this is peter laying it all out in his last inspired epistle this is what he says at the start and this faith becomes active and grows and so jesus christ has given as the object of our faith the special object of saving faith the divine promises God hath given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And the promises are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. He gives us this precious faith. He doesn't give it to everybody. 
And then he gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness in the power of faith that's in us, united to Jesus Christ. And then he gives us these exceeding great and precious promises for the exercise of our faith that through believing we may be strengthened with all might in the inner man. And the Christian should be confident that he doesn't lack anything in the initiation of his or her salvation. And you can guess that it continues through the Christian life, not just at the start, but right the way onwards. The tense of the two verbs that I've been referring to in verses 3 and 4, the tense is perfect. That is, God hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. At a certain point in the past, God gave us this, and therefore we still have it. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. When we were converted, God said, here you are, here are all the promises. And they're still with you. You have them to this day. Oh, so the start and the way this life was given to you and the promises continue all the way forward. And because of this, or on account of this, the Christian is then called to give all diligence to add to his faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. And here we need to understand that this does not mean that Jesus is a complete saviour at your conversion. And then he says, it's over to you. It's not like your great uncle with loads of money has given you a car. He says, here it is, it's all of me, and now you have this car. And how you drive this car and what you do with it is, it's over to you. <coughs> Instead, the idea is that Jesus Christ, at our conversion, equips us and empowers us for the whole of our Christian lives with the new nature and all the precious promises. And now because you have this power and these promises, fill out and grow in your faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this word add, add to your faith, A, B, C, D, E, and G, means furnish, supply, fill it out, and to fill it out as a beautiful chorus. And the Christian life requires many graces and qualities, all of which together make a harmonious chorus. Not discordant, not ugly, but beautiful. That's the idea. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this identifying and developing each and every one of these Christian graces. And it's not the idea either that you add one grace and then, and only then, do you add another grace. Rather, you furnish by God's Spirit a harmonious chorus of graces. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, together, beauty and harmony. That's the Christian life. That's the fruit of the Spirit manifested in us. And we're called to be diligent to furnish that choir of virtues. Energetic. By the grace of God making us what we are. We have this precious faith, this gift of godliness and life and all the promises. And let's go further, the last and shortest point. He has saved us, he is saving us and making us active by his grace and he will save us. Heaven, it is no surprise, and our glorification is entirely the work of Jesus Christ. Just as his atonement, so too our glorification. Only ever, even from the most ardent Pelagian or Arminian, could only be glorification. Could only be, although they can corrupt it too, a divine work. But all of this preparation for it and the glorious expectancy of it, that too is wrought by Jesus Christ 
in us alone, in the way of diligence and bringing out the graces that God is working within us, which comes through these divine gifts of faith, the power of godliness and the divine promises, Peter is explaining that the child of God has and ought to have the confidence and comfort of glory. For so, verse 11 says, in this way, an entrance shall be supplied or ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those who live out of faith, who b live virtuously by the Spirit and bear fruit, in this way, there's an entrance which opens up wide before you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Peter there warns that we mustn't be short-sighted. We mustn't be short-sighted when we look back, verse 9, becoming blind even, so that we forget that we've been purged from our own sins. And we mustn't be short-sighted or blind when we look forward either, not being able to see afar off for the everlasting kingdom. But through this faith and this divine life, the Bible says, so an entrance opened up abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. And the call of the Christian, therefore, is to be thankful for the great salvation which Jesus Christ has freely given us and for the great Savior that he is, has saved us, is saving us, Will, saving us, will save us the great and precious promises. And then the Christian turns to worship him. He's my Lord. He's my God. He's my Savior. And the Christian says, I must press on by his grace and persevere to the very end. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that the light and grace of Jesus Christ would open our eyes that we may see more of the wonder of his work. We ask, Lord, that thou would give us this gratitude from the heart and that thou would change and transform us into what we ought to be as the sons and daughters of our gracious Father in heaven, thankful and obedient and filled with joy. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.